Um, as I said, we have Ugo Garnacci with us, uh, the, the Open Heritage uh, Project Advisor uh, from the European Commission. Ugo, uh, thank you very much for being with us. You were supposed to be there for the first dialogue, um, but then unfortunately uh, you, were, uh, you were sick. So those of you who, who were there for the first dialogue and were waiting for your presentation, um, now uh, after a long wait, get to hear it. So welcome and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yasmin, for this nice introduction and good afternoon, everyone. It's a big pleasure for being here as a project advisor for Open Heritage. And apologies, as you said, the first dialogue was not my actually fault, it was more health related issue, but uh, nothing serious. So uh, I'm a um, project advisor at the European Commission Executive Agency for Small and Medium Sized Enterprises, EASME. And you, as you might know, we manage several EU funded programs. And I will focus today on Horizon 2020, which is the current. Uh, a framework program for research and innovation, try to understand what do we mean by partnership, and in particular, partnership in the context of uh, cultural heritage, and then zoom in to adaptive heritage reuse. So if we go to the next slide, I think uh, Horizon 2020 has been instrumental in defining partnership in a variety of ways. You know, we had the future and emerging technology flagship, we had the public to public partnership where we were looking at uh, instrument that might be familiar to some of the uh, audience here, where, for instance, the European Commission was uh, um, joining forces with member state-led initiatives, uh, such as the joint programming uh, initiative, uh, like the one on cultural heritage, uh, uh, where the main aim was to define a strategic research innovation agenda, SRIA, on key topic related to cultural heritage and adaptive use is indeed coming in the latest year as one of the prominent ones. But also the um, Ernest Cofund, which is a partnership that the European Commission fostered throughout a top up from Horizon 2020, where the European Commission uh, finance a joint, single joint call among the different uh, member states. We also had the um, European Institution for Innovation and Technology, EIT, kicks the knowledge and innovation communities, which is another form of partnership was in Horizon 2020. And of course, the classic, uh, more structured public-private uh, um, partnerships, uh, the so-called contractual PPPs, which were actually touching upon several topics uh, in Horizon 2020, most of them quite technical, but even there, cultural heritage ended up being a, a prominent element. And if, for instance, if you consider the PPPs on energy efficiency building, you would see that even there, there was a strong community talking about energy efficiency within historic buildings and the issue of that reuse was indeed mentioned. Of course, Horizon Europe, which is the next uh, uh, framework program for research and innovations, tried to put some order in this partnership and there are three main groups, the co-funded European partnership, which basically take into account most of the P2P partnership existing in Horizon 2020, the institutionalized European partnership where you will see the joint undertaking, which is uh, like a big uh, uh, air partnership having a technological and uh, demonstration topics together with the IT uh, kicks. Uh, and then PPPs are uh, then called now in Horizon Europe uh, co-program European partnership. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this was how to, you know, we frame it in the research and innovation arena, the level, but you will see that actually we're trying also to mirror some of the policy languages using by other big commission services, uh, uh, in particular those working more on uh, the urban and regional agenda. And in particular, if you look at the European agenda for the EU, you will see that now we have a 14 thematic partnership, and one of that is really devoted to culture and cultural heritage. I want to say that this partnership are actually using also uh, a framework, which is the framework that the urban agenda for the EU is proposing, uh, structured around three main lines of thought, better knowledge, better funding, and better innovation. And I think there, the debate around culture and cultural heritage has been indeed instrumental, because if we go to the next slide, you will see that uh, I believe uh, that this new partnership on culture and cultural heritage is a real example on caring and sharing. Indeed, when the uh, urban partnership within the urban agenda for the EU were launched, there were 12. 
and there was a missing element. The missing element was indeed uh, culture and cultural heritage. And therefore, there was a movement uh, between member states, between cities and regions and city networks to raise awareness about this lack of focus on culture and cultural heritage. And that's why two other urban partnerships were, were added, one on public space and one on culture and cultural heritage. As you see, the two coordinators in terms of member states are Germany and Italy, for you know, other member states are Cyprus, France, Greece, and Spain, and you have a variety of regions and cities across Europe uh, uh, joining forces uh, with the European Commission. They put up an uh, uh, action plan, which I found pretty interesting for today's topic, because it's structured around landscape, intangible heritage, and monuments, and the uh, central pillar of that action plan is indeed touching upon adaptive use uh, as a key element for urban regeneration. So they have five sectoral uh, thematic, as you can see in the picture, and two just cutting issues around finance and uh, governance. If you look to the, if you go to the next slide, what I want to say is that we are actually building partnership for the EU RNI landscape. We are translating those uh, uh, into the urban agenda for the EU, but we also joining the dots between different actors uh, between different EU funded programs. Of course, Horizon 2020 being the starting point for us in order to build this community of practice on cultural heritage and cultural heritage that we use, but also joining forces with uh, the different stakeholders and creative artists uh, and other institutions that are generally more used to apply for the Creative Europe program or actually looking at the, the territorial dimension coming from urban and the urban innovative action. And last but not least, the joining forces with the more regional dimension of those action on cultural aid that we use within the internet program. So as you can see, a partnership can also be a cross program. And uh, the nice things of those partnerships, sometimes they manage to include unusual um, uh, actually actors, so not just the usual suspects that we hold, always have in each program, but also allowing us, uh, the European level, to discover some nuances that the locality indeed offers in line with the subsidiarity principle. And my last slide to keep on time is about actually how fantastic, and I want to highlight this, Horizon 2020 has been in putting this emphasis on adaptive use of cultural heritage beyond the thematic silos. And I think a crucial year to highlight this effort was the 2018 uh, European Year of Cultural Heritage towards the European Declaration on uh, the uh, adaptive use of the built uh, heritage, because one of the key principles of the declaration was this dialogue between heritage and contemporary um, architecture. And you know, you were asking before the audience how they want to travel. And indeed, this principle recall as the attention to the fact that each of the reused project needs to have a link between past, present, and future. And I think that if you look at the way our Horizon 2020 project here, I'm just mentioning a few of them, but this is not just an exhaustive picture. We have much more on that. But if you look at how that reviews have been addressed, not only in very specific research and innovation action, like your project over heritage and the CLIC project, which is your sister project, but also in other projects where the thematic focus was not uh, culturated that we use. If you look at ProGireg, which is on uh, our uh, nature-based solution uh, are um, actually have been used to um, for urban regeneration, you will see that they're actually uh, reflecting upon the reuse of the industrial heritage. Urbinac is looking at uh, healthy corridors in order to reconnect different areas of uh, cities across Europe. Reflow, which is has a strong focus on circular economy, is also looking at the circularity um, involving also the fab maker, the city maker, on uh, how we can even revitalize uh, uh, abandoned or contested heritage. Inhabit, which is a project on health and well-being, looking at uh, how contested heritage can be revitalized uh, uh, in conjunction with uh, nature-based social and digital innovation. And last but not least, the three new projects that we have uh, launched uh, on transforming historic urban areas and cultural landscape into hubs for entrepreneurship have been Centrino and Tifacta, where they all address indeed uh, the issue of uh, heritage-led urban regeneration. Rock being our first project that we funded uh, in uh, uh, Horizon 2020 on this matter. So this last slide was to highlight once more 
that I think uh, in Horizon 2020, we're really able to build partnership and synergies uh, about people that care and we're allowed to share the idea that uh, cultural heritage is not only there to be protected and uh, restored, but it's also there to be used in a different way for a sustainable urban regeneration, also giving consideration to the territorial dimension. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ugo. I think that was a great, uh, great uh, sentence to, to end on. Um, we you know we don't have an explicit uh, Q&A planned in here, but uh, if there are any questions for Ugo, I think you're with us for a little bit longer, right? Uh, put them in the chat and uh, we'll either forward him uh, the message or he'll see it or um, uh, he can get back to you directly. Even though I actually saw there is a question right this moment, Ugo. Um, I'm just gonna read this to you. Um, from partnership perspective in Horizon 2020 uh, Urban Agenda, what are the upcoming approaches to enhance or to enforce PPP and entrepreneurship in the context of cultural heritage? So what I mentioned, the co-programmed uh, partnership as are the one that actually are in the uh, in the process of being defined. So we are not yet in the process of saying whether or not will be a specific one on cultural heritage, but be reassured that the co-creation process that you've seen in some of the uh, project like Open Heritage are uh, looking at different PPPs, and I will also add another P, the fourth P, which is people, uh, will remain there as a key pillar of uh, heritage coming from uh, Horizon 2020. All right, thank you. And there was another question if uh, this presentation, also the the uh, others will be uploaded. I will have to check uh, with everyone, um, but I assume uh, that most of them are okay with it. And um, we will also have a recording, of course, of this uh, session uh, for you to uh, to watch. All right, thank you, uh, Ugo, for now. And uh, we're moving uh, to the next uh, presentation, which is Hannah Semso um, from the Metropolitan Research Institute in Budapest. As I said before, she is, um, or they are coordinating the Open Heritage Project and she will be talking about what partnerships mean in, in that project in particular. So Hannah, I think I will stop sharing my screen now so you can start sharing yours. Thank you. I'll, I'll um, just, I probably need 10 seconds to do that. Um, okay. Just a moment. Uh, can you see my screen? So is it working now? Uh, it was loading, but now it should yeah. be yeah. okay. Okay, if there's something wrong, just please let me know immediately. And Yashmin and Olga have a backup copy for my presentation. But I think this is just to keep the spirit of these webinars. There's always something that's difficult. Um, I, I'm trying to put it on. Yes, and I think it's working. So hello, everyone. I'll try to keep uh, to the time. And it's very nice to follow Ugo's presentation. My name is Hannah Semza. I'm one of the coordinators of Open Heritage. Um, and what I will do is do a very brief introduction of Open Heritage, really focusing on this how the concept of partnership in the project, partially because some people have you know, been present, uh, were already present in the previous dialogue, and partially it's also important for myself not to keep repeating myself every now and then, because then it's, it, it gets boring. Uh, so just very, very briefly, it's a research and innovation project, which means we not only get to study things, but we also get to do things, which is a very wonderful experience. And it is reflected, it's a, it's a four years old and it's a four, four year old long project. And this duality is reflected uh, in the partnership that consists of 16 partners uh, with very diverse background, municipalities, SMEs, foundation, research organizations. Um, and even universities. So, the, and if I wanted to summarize our main aim, we are working on sustainable management models for adaptive heritage reuse that are applicable in bottom-up initiatives. This is one of our keywords, and this is where partnership really comes in, in marginalized areas. This is a second keyword for the project. So we really focus in the areas that are either socially or geographically marginalized. We use the concept very broadly, um, not very scientifically defined, but, but what we basically mean by is that uh, we work uh, and study areas that are not very frequented. Um, and in this, back, in this um, concept uh, and in this framework, openness is a very crucial concept in our work. 
it, it comes up again and again as we try to operate with a very open definition, definition of heritage. So we want communities to be involved in defining it and maintaining it, but not only communities who live locally there, but we, we use the word heritage community, involve everyone who might not live uh, I might not live on the spot, but should be interested in maintaining and, and using the site. We also used um, openness regarding when we look for uh, ways of adaptive reuse. So we want it to be inclusive, flexible, adaptable. And finally, and this brings out to the topic of, of today, we build an openly expanding partnership. So we try to make them as as, as wide as possible, keeping in mind, of course, the difficulties. And this is some of the difficult questions some of them I, will, I, will, um, I will talk about now. Of course, this is, I mean, I would love to say, but we, we didn't invent this importance of bottom-up initiatives of partnership. It's been going on for a long time. If you look at international declarations, the role of EU, UNESCO, national policy papers, regulations, and even local practices actually, where you can actually see how the, the governance model plays out for partnership. It's been there. It's been really even starting from the 70s, 80s, it's, it's been coming. So in the field of adapted heritage reuse, the notion has become more and more important that it's okay to say a few things from the top, but it's even much better to, to work uh, with sustainable local uh, partnerships and, and, and work with them um, in a bottom-up way. But of course, partnerships are easy to say, but, this, uh, but of course, when you work on the governance model, it becomes a bit more complicated. And the reason it becomes complicated, of course, they are not new. If you look, historically speaking, civic initiatives, NGOs or whatever you want to call them, have always been crucial actors in providing services uh, when there was no welfare state. So if you, if you look at welfare provision, even if you look at heritage protection, they were empowered individuals and organizations that started it. But their roles have changed dramatically as the welfare state developed. And what we are working on now is re-embedding these partnerships locally in the framework of well or moderately well functioning welfare state. And that gives us questions and problems to think about. So you do have to think about roles and responsibilities and accountability, who does what? I mean, you have the official structure and you have the unofficial structure and they have to cooperate. It also is very important the question of financing because of course there is the need for public financing, but it also means that, uh, that you have to find a way where innovative financing models can complement or even take partially uh, or partially replace the role of public financing. And I think partnerships become the most interesting and at the same time most problematic when it comes to something that I can best term as knowledge production. When you focus on bottom-up initiatives and when you focus on community involvement, then you do your face with the question of expert and community knowledge, how they complement each other, how they can live side by side. And also you are faced partially with the limits of community involvement if you just think about contested or dark heritage. So this, this re-embedding process is what we are uh, working on. Um, okay. And when talking about open heritage, uh, specifically, you probably, uh, you also see, um, uh, you, you also you, you don't see the part we, we work on partnerships on three different levels and the easiest which is partly covered um, by um, by zoom's automatic function of the speakers is that the partnerships within the consortium it's an easy target but i think it's very important it's our testing ground how people with different backgrounds work together and strive for a mutual uh, for a common aim where, of course, we put our research um, and implementation efforts is on the one hand local partnerships or where we would prefer to call partnerships around sites because you don't have to live there locally to be involved in the partnerships is um, where in different sites we study them and we also try them and one and these partnerships do need to include, of course, communities, NGOs, different um, 
expert stakeholders, and it has become a conviction that the local authorities, they are not, of course, the protagonist, but they have to be there. Otherwise, this coalition, this partnership becomes very fragile. And we also work on a vertical in, uh, or institutional partnerships as unless these local partnerships are embedded in their national institutional framework, we think they also become not, uh, very fragile and not sustainable. So when we specifically work on, on uh, new governance models of co-creation, we ask the questions, how can these different actors mutually support each other and complement each other? It's very important to define, and this you will uh, hear a bit more in one of the breakout rooms, to, to define exactly what these bottom-up partnerships bring. How can they contribute to new services, new products, or what, in what ways can they reach new de demographics? Because this is precisely the argument we have. So that's why next to welfare state structure, we have to support them. And finally, we do need to focus on the specific role these partnerships fulfill in case of marginalized areas. Uh, just very briefly, we work, you will learn a lot more. So we, when we, we study 16 observatory cases, and you will hear the method about them uh, right after me, and you will get to know three of them um, in detail, that are all innovative bottom-up experiences, either providing housing or culture or welfare services that would not be there without them. And what we learn, we try to test and also try to develop the governance model in six very different um, heritage sites that are spread around Europe. As you can see, we also work with buildings, bigger sites, and also um, and also ruins, and try to just you know bring a second life to ruins. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, you can learn the observatory cases. There's a link, and also about what goes in the labs. And of course, I'm open to questions, but that's would be from me right now. Thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, I think this is a perfect uh, segue to the, the next uh, presentation. I don't know if there are any questions at this moment. Um, if uh, they come in later, uh, you can just um, respond to them in the chat. Uh, I think we'll move on now, but I want to point out, Ugo, that there's actually a question in the chat on um, the EU's uh, international partnerships. Um, and maybe you can get back to that in the chat. And those of you who are interested in the response, uh, keep an eye out in the chat what, what he's got to uh, say on that. Um, but now we'll hear from uh, Levente Puliak. He's co-founder of Utopian, and uh, they are another partner of, of the Open Heritage. And he will be talking about uh, the observatory cases and is later joined by some of them. Uh, he will then be introducing um, the, the people who are, who are presenting and uh, he's interviewing. So Levente, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot, Yasmin, and thanks a lot, uh, Hannah, for introducing most of the things. And thanks, Ugo, for the, the overall context. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the observatory cases themselves, uh, as Hannah already mentioned. Uh, also a little bit because, because it was a very important part of the whole proposal that we created originally, that um, we, Utopian, where I'm from, we are not academics at all. And we thought, we felt that uh, in a lot of heritage-related research, there's uh, simply too much theory. So we thought it's, uh, uh, there's a little bit of a gap between academic research and uh, underground research uh, and underground action. So what we wanted to make sure is that we have, um, we have uh, a lot of initiatives in a way directly or indirectly involved in the process and observatory cases were in a way the medium to bring uh, these very concrete uh, initiatives in the process. So we, th we, we were designing, um, this is one of the work packages of the, of the project, as you know, in Horizon, there's this uh, universe of work, work, uh, work packages and the, the observatory cases were uh, designed uh, in a way to um, look at some prototypes. So we were looking at cases from which we can learn. We can learn from them in terms of community and stakeholder involvement, resource integration, financial management, and the area-based territorial approach. So we could see that they have an impact. Uh, uh, well, they have an in innovative financial model, governance model. They have an impact on the territory. Uh, they have an impact on the, the local context. So. Uh, they actually they are very important in the, the context where they're situated and we were positioning the observatory cases as 
as uh, studies that would inform broader scientific research in the, uh, in, in the Open Heritage Program. They would also inform the creation of models because we, we were looking at the, the observatory cases as, of course, you know, very unique uh, uh, initiatives in very unique uh, situations, but we were trying to identify some elements like models uh, mechanisms that could be used elsewhere. And this brings us back a little bit also to the, to the, uh, the, the labs, the heritage labs, where we are trying also to use some of the things that we learn from the observatory cases in uh, developing new cases or actually helping already existing initiatives. And also um, observatory cases had an important role in the tool development, so helping uh, by extracting or understanding, identifying uh, models. Uh, we are also working on a series of tools as an outcome of Open Heritage. And also, as I just mentioned, in, in the implementation of the Heritage Lab. So the whole point of these uh, observatory cases is that we wanted to learn from them and we wanted to learn uh, their experiences, uh, bring their experiences into the broader context uh, and also spread them around Europe. Now, what we did in the research, we uh, within Utopian, we uh, and, and you know, including the whole partnership, we co-designed a methodology to look at the cases. So we were looking at, uh, on the one hand, the stories of the protagonists, the mot motivations, the story of the initiatives. Uh, we were looking at the architecture of the spaces. We were looking at uh, the social context uh, and also geographical and demographic uh, uh, environments. We were looking at the policies that are in a way impact uh, the initiative help or also block in a way. So uh, look at all kinds of regulations that are in play, maybe other regulations that would be needed to help them, but others that uh, also may be in place and are uh, create a barrier. We were also looking at financial models as a very important uh, element of these because we are you know, aiming at uh, in a way enhancing or, or uh, encouraging sustainable financial models where, because we see a lot of examples, of course, that the heritage site is renovated with a lot of public money and then it's left uh, uh, with no function. And this is a very, very important problem, I think, in a lot of uh, contexts in Europe. So we wanted to avoid this and we explore different kinds of uh, very interesting financial and economic models within the observatory cases. And then of course, a partnership as we talk uh, about today, is uh, it was involved in the stakeholder analysis that we created where we were looking at uh, also community involvement and also how different kinds of partnerships came together on these sites. And then something that uh, was very important is, is impact to understand what kind of impact do these initiatives have, but also in terms of inspiration, uh, we saw that uh, some cases like Staratvision so that we will talk about uh, today more in details, that they inspired a lot of other models across Slovakia and is even beyond. No? So the idea was to understand how, how to build on these, uh, these ideas and initiatives. Um, in the case, in the, in the research, we were um, looking at uh, these projects in depth. We were doing, uh, we were encouraging all our partners uh, that are, were, you know, doing some of the observatory case research to do some desk research, but also especially do a series of site visits, make interviews. Um, we created a kind of a, like a, a, a bit of a, a preparation kit where we a little bit also prepared uh, people how to organize these meetings, how to organize the whole visit. Uh, and then we were asking as outputs some audio and video recordings and also think a little bit also visually in diagrams because we thought if you want to do a bit of a less academic kind of research, it's important to also be visually uh, compelling. And then, uh, then we created a series of deliverables that you will be able to find and I will share uh, with you again where is the observatory case studies and documentary videos that uh, are already available. Hanna already mentioned, so I don't want to go too much into details, but uh, it's just a little note on how we selected the cases that we, we looked at uh, different, uh, like a diversity of, of, of projects with a diversity of uh, geogra geographical positions all across Europe, different kinds of spatial and architectural settings, different kinds of functions, different management models, and also different governance uh, ties because we wanted to be more or less uh, more or less uh, representative. This is something Hanna already showed, 
as uh, the diversity of the places, we try to create this typology and uh, uh, iconology of different uh, initiatives. And it's very important that uh, you already start uh, seeing on social media in other places, some of the videos that we created, because we thought it's very important to give a bit of a visual opportunity, audiovisual opportunity to the cases to tell their stories. And here with my colleague, uh, Yilmaz Buruju, for example, we, we created six videos. Uh, here we are in Lisbon in the making of one of the, the videos, also following a, 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 well, a, a pre-designed, uh, let's say visual and also structural uh, set of, uh, of instructions. So we, we invited all our partners to work along uh, a bit the same line. So the result is uh, actually 16 in-depth case studies that you can find on openheritage.eu. Uh, where you can find, you can download and read uh, each of the, the cases. And also you can watch all the videos also on Vimeo, but also uh, on the Open Heritage uh, website. Also, it's important that we were trying to reach uh, uh, as broad an audience as possible. So we already uh, circulated some of the videos in uh, exhibitions. If you're in Berlin right now, you go to the Living the City exhibition, you can, you can see uh, some of the videos, uh, we had some other festivals in Vienna and, and we will continue uh, sharing these videos because we think these, uh, this, this format tells a lot and it's very useful to tell the story of these initiatives. And I think uh, my time is coming to an end, so I would uh, stop here and I would move on uh, to the question of partnerships because uh, as Hanna also mentioned, uh, partnerships are very crucial in this whole uh, process and also in observatory cases we explored a lot of very exciting partnerships and based on this we are invited some uh, some very interesting participants today three of whom are actually observatory cases of ours and one uh, is from another project that I thought uh, would be very interesting to have with us so I would like to welcome with us uh, Denisa Kilova from Stara Trishnica in Bratislava uh, Bojena, Zalaki, uh, Z sorry. Bojena Z Zakaliuzna from Gem Factory uh, Lviv. I'm sorry, again, I'll, by the end of today, I think I'll be better. Uh, uh, Petra Marcinko from Lazaretti, Dubrovnik. The, uh, this is the only case that is not part of the observatory case uh, circle in Open Heritage. But it's part of uh, Active NGOs, another project I'm involved in. And uh, actually, in the beginning, we wanted to have them in Open Heritage as well, because it's an amazing case. But uh, we already had too many really interesting cases. And then uh, Nadia Nadesan from Patonik, who was uh, the organization that was involved in uh, fundraising and uh, you know, development and help of the La Fabrica de Toda la Vida, another case uh, study within uh, op uh, Open Heritage. So I would like to start with a little video about Sarah Tejica, and then I will uh, invite Denisa to tell a few words about uh, what the initiative is. Of course, this is the part that uh, we've tried a few times before, and of course, sometimes it works, sometimes it I doesn't. I am sharing the videos. Okay, perfect. Uh, so you will see some of the, some of the shorter videos that we also uh, invited participants, uh, partners to do, because we thought on the one hand, we can have longer videos, but also very short videos, which are looking at the case studies from one specific aspect. So I give it over to you, Laura. Do I think there's no sound again? Hey, once again. only the first one the second and uh, third and fourth videos will then be uh, flawless uh, Stara Tržnica as I see it as I came to discover it is um, I see it as the heart of the city my job was to implement the ideas that we had about how to build a community around the market. I've always we've designed it this way that the market, even though it's inside uh, it, and technically maybe it's private space, we are gonna uh, always set it up as a public space. 
so uh, nobody has to buy anything. I try to implement um, mm, this sense of community also towards minorities, so there's a, a successful project with Community Kitchen. Uh, every Saturday it's running and it's going really well. Like it happened to us in the first few markets, first months that we were doing markets, that people would literally come into the building, look up, look down, and they would start crying. And start to like overwhelmed with stories and histories of, of this building, of what it, what it basically meant to them or to their family or what kind of memories they have. Thank you, Dora. So I would like to invite uh, Denise uh, Kilova from Startup Vision. Uh, uh, this video allowed us a little bit to have a, a glimpse of what Startup Vision is. Uh, Denise, are you, are you with us? Yes, I am. Yes, so thanks a lot for joining us. We, we, we know that, I mean, of course, nowadays, uh, like all public venues, uh, Startup Vision is in a very specific situation, but a little bit tell us in a few minutes about uh, Startup Register, what it is, if, if I go to Bratislava and, and I see this, what, what do I find there? What is this initiative? Okay, uh, I will try to share just a few pictures with you. All right. <laughs> so, uh, Stara Tržnica is the old market hall uh, in Bratislava, Slovakia. It was built in uh, 1910 and uh, it is a cultural heritage. Uh, the building had quite a funny history because it served as the market hall for 50 years, then it became TV studios for another, I think, 60 years and so on. Uh, in the 90s, the city became the owner and they pretty much didn't really know what to do with it because you need like a lot of financial resources as well as personal resources. So they tried to rent it. There was kind of a mall for some time, but it didn't work. So this is what it looked like in uh, 2012 where we came to the picture. Uh, we meaning the Old Market Hall Alliance, which is a civic uh, association. Uh, we came together like 11 professionals from uh, various fields and we put together a project, how to revitalize the building, how to turn it into an urban center to open it to the public. And uh, all this uh, without necessarily like a financial or any, any other input from the city. And uh, we got the contract. We work, uh, we rent the, the building from the city. We've been there for uh, seven years. And uh, this is where we got. We have uh, markets every Saturday. We have or had before COVID-19 events on the other days of the week. We have businesses running uh, around. We also uh, broadened our activities to the square in front of the other market hall, which you can see at the photo. And uh, we also invest into the building because it was really neglected. You can see the inside. So we pretty much turned it into something that is modern and working and uh, should be there for many years to come. So I think that's the brief introduction. And if you have any other questions, we can speak about it later. Thank you very much, Denise. It's a very, uh, very specific and very spectacular uh, case. We'll be uh, back to you with some more questions and especially looking at uh, the partnerships that you you build up but i would like to mm -hmm. uh, invite the second video about the jam factory and then we will have a very quick uh, introduction from uh, bojana and again you will see a short uh, we call them the quote videos which are to be circulated uh, mostly in a, in a social media context, which look at one very specific aspect of, uh, of the, the case. Because we, have, uh, we also asked partners to create a number of quote videos that look at different aspects, because of course there are many ways to tell. <laughs> Thank you. 
Для нас це дуже важливо, власне, формувати середовище, середовище думаюче, яке обговорює, презентує сучасне мистецтво. Це мультифункціональний арт-центр, тобто ми не зосереджуємося лише на візуальному мистецтві. Для нас дуже важливо розвивати театральне мистецтво, візуальне і музику. І довкола цього осердям ми поставили освіту у мистецтві, з чого ми якраз зараз і починаємо. Тобто ми зараз запускаємо вже, не чекаючи повного відновлення усіх будівель, ми вже запускаємо різні освітні програми. Зокрема, ми запустили освітню програму про сучасний театр. Зараз теж ми готуємо програму освітньо про сучасне мистецтво, бо для того, аби сприймати і бути готовим до діалогу, дуже важливо розуміти, бо сучасне мистецтво, тобто ключем це є власне освіта і розуміння, для чого митець, автор так зробив щось, що ми хочемо презентувати і який діалог ми хочемо започаткувати. Thank you, Dora. Thank you. Bojana, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hi. It's very nice to see you after the video as well. Right. right. We could also see you. You were the protagonist of this video. Can you tell us in a few, few words, uh, can you introduce the Gem Factory? Yes, I will. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I would like to say that here are uh, uh, present a few other people. Um, Harold Binder, um, who is the founder of the Jam Factory uh, project and uh, also for two other colleagues who are uh, participating and uh, um, with uh, and collaborating in this project with the Jam Factory. It's, uh, uh, as I can see, Irena Matauko and uh, uh, another Irena. Um, so um, these two people also could probably um, talk later on the right in the um, breakout rooms. Um, so uh, first of all, um, you, you, it was not, um, I saw that there was no uh, subtitles in English, but probably most of you didn't understand at all what I was talking about. Uh, so the Jan Factory Art Center um, is um, a institution um, for contemporary art center. Uh, the project started, uh, it started in 2015 when Harold Binder decided to support an initiative that was before. Um, and um, uh, with that purpose, Harold Binder organized the Harold Binder Culture Enterprises and supported um, and uh, started to lead the project, uh, the transformation of the heritage building, which you saw in the video and um, into a contemporary art center. Um, I prepared a presentation, but actually something is not working, so I cannot share it right now. So I will try to imp and explain that uh, by words. I had a few questions addressed um, uh, to me about the partnership, right? Which is the topic of today's. And we will have time a little bit later more in depth for this, yeah. Right, so um, um, I would like to stress on a few points. So um, partnership and uh, with Harald Binder was very crucial for our project. Without that, uh, probably that wouldn't be feasible to implement this idea of uh, creating an art center in the old factory. Um, this is what first um, point that I would like to make. Uh, another point, uh, cooperation with, um, with other partners and municipality. Uh, so I divide this, our, our project into two uh, major parts. The first one is the regeneration project itself, which consists of various partners which we have. So we, are, we have partners uh, from Austria, uh, Austrian Bureau uh, Atelier Stefan Rindra, it's an architecture bureau, also partners, local architectural bureau, um, as well the company which uh, leads all the projects the management of the construction uh, um, and the um, signing contracts and uh, finding uh, contractors in terms of the 
building, re reconstructing and um, renewing the building. The other big uh, part, the, the second one, right, was uh, also very important, is creation of um, organization itself. And I would like to point out that we have started also working, as this was shown in the video, working with the content, which is the contemporary art. Uh, in our city, which is more than 800,000, and we are, um, it's a, a UNESCO uh, city, there is no um, contemporary art center. And that was a really big motivation for um, creating such an institution. That's why it's very important for us that we uh, haven't uh, yet uh, finished with the renovation process, but we have already a team that is working with contemporary art projects. Thanks, Bojana. We'll, I think we can get back to this in details. Now, I would like to move on because I just want to have a first glimpse into all the projects so that also people can, because we're receiving a lot of questions to, to me, but I think I'm much less interesting here than you. So I would also like to ask our listeners to uh, also ask questions to, to you because you, you, you know the, all the details and all the technical details and all the legal and partnership details of your project. So I think that's much more interesting than what I can share with the, the readers uh, and the listeners. But I would like to move on to Dubrovnik and I would like to uh, also ask Dora to uh, bring us to Dubrovnik with a little video. As you will see, this is another kind of video because this is not part of Open Heritage. So it's, uh, it has a, a, a bit of, a, of another kind of structure and also it's a more amatorial uh, video done by uh, myself. So this is a, an old uh, ex-quarantine uh, complex. It is a heritage site. It is included into the, um, the center of Dubrovnik is protected by UNESCO. Originally it was used as a quarantine. It was built in the middle of the, the half of the 17th century. Uh, the city council and the general urbanistic plan uh, says that this space will be reserved only for culture and education. There will be allowed some kind of commercial activities just to help the sustain sustainability of the complex, but not as a, as a main uh, type of activities. Uh, the current dilemma with Lazaretti is uh, that uh, we are uh, in a phase of some kind of transference from one stage to another. Uh, where there is this project, Lazaretti, a creative hub of Dubrovnik, which is uh, basically aimed uh, to renovate uh, the last three buildings of, uh, of the Lazaretti complex that hasn't been renovated in a previous renovation, and that was uh, occupied by, by the NGOs. The NGOs now are moved to previously renovated um, uh, premises, in Lazaretti owned by the city of Dubrovnik. We are here temporarily now and we are waiting for our spaces to be renovated. And uh, the current issues are how to integrate all the users, all different kinds of users and uh, types of activities and different, uh, 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 different uh, aims of the projects that we have together into one uh, publicly owned, open, uh, inclusive, participative cultural center of Dubrovnik. So this was Srajana from Dubrovnik. Uh, as you see, it's, it's an amazing place and it's looking back to these uh, beautiful buildings and beautiful venues from this dark November. I think it gives a little bit back some, some hope towards the future, not only towards the past. I would like to invite very quickly to Petra to tell about uh, the Lazaretti and Lazaretti platform in Dubrovnik. Just okay, a few hi. words, please. Uh, I'll just uh, use the PowerPoint. Just one second. Uh, so I think we can skip a uh, majority of uh, what's written here in this uh, presentation if it ever shows up. Basically, what uh, Sejana said uh, was as an introduction is that uh, it was built in 1642 as a um, quarantine. Um, and uh, towards the beginning of the 20th century, it didn't really have a permanent purpose or integrated purpose of the whole uh, heritage site. 
1979, there were some uh, pressures of commercialization even at the beginning of the 20th century, but from the 80s uh, onwards, it has the status of a place of uh, independent culture, arts, youth, etc. So at the beginning of the 1990s, it had this discourse of abandoned, dilapidated, far away uh, place when the NGOs actually uh, started to use the place permanently. And in 2000s, we can uh, see uh, this first uh, beginning of the public civil partnership in this um, uh, contract that uh, Art Workshop Lazarity signed with the city of Dubrovnik for the project Quarantine, which had as its um, main premise this cultural center. Uh, and it was supposed to be, uh, and it was uh, financed by the World Monument Fund in order to renovate the whole complex and to transform it into um, a cultural center, which has art school, residency for artists, and NGOs residing there. I think we have most. Uh, one of the most complicated uh, governance structures uh, now. I'm not. We can talk about uh, later on um, in more in detail. But uh, we have several actors that are very powerful when it comes to formal means of uh, governance by contracts, etc. But also as uh, practice, practice. So uh, what we were trying to um, reconciliate in this manner. Um, we have this uh, common idea of social cultural center that Lazarity needs to be, but at the same time, how do we um, work on integrating this uh, whole uh, complex with all of these actors that are very strong? So what we've uh, figured out after, I think, two years of working on it is that uh, we have this partnership model of two working groups, uh, which is uh, contextually conditioned variation of uh, participatory governance which actually at the same time refers the autonomy of organizations in Lazarity, but in respects the diversity that one social cultural center needs to have. And uh, at the same time, it nurtures trust and collaboration between all the actors. Um, and hopefully someday in the future, it will develop into something more uh, stable and concrete as a gov uh, governance uh, model. So I think that's it uh, for me now. We can talk about Thank you very, very much, yeah. Petra. I'll also see you in the breakout room later. Mm -hmm. um, I would move on to uh, La Fabrica de Toda la Vida, so the last video we have today, and then have a little chat with Nadia about uh, the initiative. In the meanwhile, before we start the, the video, I would also like to uh, invite everyone on Facebook as well that don't hesitate to write questions and comments because we see them, we see everything that is coming in. Para mí el hecho de haber vuelto al pueblo después de tanto tiempo sí que está significando en, en gran parte el replantearme cómo se puede transformar desde lo más cotidiano, desde lo más cercano, desde las comunidades que están más próximas a mí a través de, de, pues de, pequeño, de, de, de pequeños cambios y, y de cómo eso puede llegar a afectar a, a otras realidades. Me parece muy importante el, el hecho de, por ejemplo, yo haber vuelto al pueblo, de cómo me identifico ahora con el pueblo y tal, y de, y de cómo empezar a transformar lo local antes que lo global. He estado muchos años fuera, mi militancia y, y mi participación ha sido siempre fuera, en ciudades. Y, y ahora ha tocado el momento de, de, de regresar, que siempre se ve como un fracaso. Que si nosotros, nosotros estamos haciendo acá una charla sobre mm, feminismo, las primeras con las que tenemos que hablar son, es con la Asociación de Mujeres, quizás. Quizás no llevan las prácticas que nosotros consideramos. Pero si queremos que realmente empoderemos y seamos todas protagonistas de, de todos los procesos que estamos llevando a cabo, tenemos que involucrar a, a, a toda la gente que hay en, en esta parte y al otro lado del muro y, y, y empezar a, a coordinarnos, ¿no? No solo, no solo por, por el hecho de facilitar los espacios, sino por, porque es parte de la identidad. O sea, yo, me, mi nombre es Elena, soy de Los Santos de Maimona, soy mujer, he sido inmigrante muchos años y todas estas cosas me están atravesando a mí. ¿Qué, ¿A quién más están atravesando?
Thanks a lot, Dora. Nadia, we have you here. Thanks a lot for making it because I know that you have another big event today. So, um, yeah. but, but the important thing is that you are here with us. Can you just in a few words tell us about Fabrica and maybe also the way you're involved from Platonic? Sure. So I am not actually part of La Fabrica de Toda la Vida in the community, but I am with Platonique and we are part of Goteo, which is the crowdfunding campaign where they crowdfunded to get a majority of the finances to renovate the building. I'm just going to share a couple slides and be brief in the interest of time. So, yeah, I'm talking about the La Fabrica de Toda la Vida case and... So um, just a little bit about its history. It is, like it was said in the video, it's a former cement factory built under Franco's dictatorship in 1956, abandoned in 1974 for decades. The residents of Los Santos de Maimona began to self-organize 10 years ago to reclaim the space. In 2013, the residents received support for their project financially through a match funding call from the region of Extremadura. The call was hosted on, Gote, on the Goteo platform, who have a history of working with match funds and public institutions. I would say that a large portion of the resources went to ensuring the safety and security of the space, which was a primary concern for the region and backing the project because actually it was very abandoned and needed a lot of work, which also came through volunteers. Since then, the space has become a place for residents and surrounding villages to meet, host events, talks as you saw, movie nights, dinners. More than just a renovation, this project has been reclaiming a community identity that was marred from the failure of the cement industry and its abandonment. And as we heard from Elena Gallero, it's also about creating a space for cultural exchange, inclusion, and cultural production from rural spaces at the periphery. That's my cat. So if anyone has any questions. I think Leventa may be gone. I don't know, Leventa, are you still with us? Yeah. Uh, he, he's kicked out. He was kicked out. Okay, I think he'll, he'll uh, be back in a moment. Um, I'm just going to uh, start addressing all these questions. There was a lot of questions, so I want to thank you all for, for being so interested in these. Also, a shout out to our Facebook viewers. We, we got a lot of questions uh, from Facebook. And um, I think while we wait uh, for Leventa, maybe we can just address uh, some of these, and um, then he can continue with, uh, with the conversation uh, he had planned. Um, I think there was a question. Is he back? No. Uh, there was a question. Um, I think that was still for, for the first um, first uh, input we got, uh, which was the, how, how was it financed the rehabilitation of the market? So uh, Denisa, um, I think that was for you. Yes. Um, we have like uh, multiple sources uh, for the financial stuff. Uh, the first thing I would like to say is, is that uh, although the building is owned by the city, we are independent financially from the city. That was the first thing that we came with. Like, we don't want to take money from the city. We all take care of the building and make the money ourselves. And how we do this is uh, uh, we rent the building for events. Uh, although pretty much most of them are actually like uh, cultural and social. And for those, we don't really charge too much money. So, but we do have like some private uh, event stuff per year, which we can like charge uh, money for this. Then we also have uh, those businesses that run uh, on the perimeter of the building. We have a cafe, we have uh, a bistro, we have a small brewery set up in there and there's a pub. So we also like rent those places. This is another source of finances for us. Uh, we also use like regular fundraising, like uh, donations uh, from the Ministry of uh, uh, Culture and, and from uh, and uh, those kind of stuff. So, and uh, very important is we also do have uh, partners from the private sector, like we used to cooperate with Volkswagen Slovakia 
at the moment we have a, a bank, the Slovenska Sporitania, as our main partner. So they also provide uh, kinds of fundings for us. So this is pretty much how it works. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, Levente is back. Levente, you can yes, take back. over again. As uh, Just so you know, I asked uh, the, the very first question we got on financing uh, the, the market. And now it's all yours again. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Yasmin, for jumping in. This is a problem that we <laughs> sometimes have. Uh, I, I got back. So uh, Denise, I think you already told a little bit about the partnership with the municipality. There was a question by Niels uh, on the chat about how did you finance? And I think the model that you created with uh, you know, not paying rent, but paying uh, uh, practically 10,000 euro a month as a, as a renovation fee. You already mentioned this, right? Uh, not, not yet. We are only That's, talking about... Because, the... because this is part of the, 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 the agreement with the, with the municipality. And this is a very unique agreement. Maybe you can yeah. mention a few words yeah. about I can it. also see another question, like uh, if we share some of the profit of the city. Uh, so this is how it works. Um, we have a rent contract. And the rent itself is uh, one euro per year. But at the same time, we are obliged to invest 120,000 euros every year into the renovation of the building. And uh, all those investments, they have to be approved by the city beforehand. And uh, it becomes part of the property, part of the building. So after our rental contract is over in uh, 15 years, when we leave, we, the city gets this renovated building with all those investments in it. So this is how it works. And uh, in case that we get to the point when uh, we won't have to renovate anything, which maybe may sometimes happen, then we will have to pay this as the rent. Thank you, Denise. Another question is, is because you mentioned you were 11 professionals coming into the, the market and you also all mobilized a little bit your, your, your network. So when I went to Startup Regions, so there was uh, this diversity of, uh, you know, cafes, but also uh, uh, all kinds of organizations inside. There was the, there's the lab with, in, a, in a cooperation with uh, a telecom company. There's the the beer brewery uh, at the at the ground at the the you know underground. minus one the underground there's the um, the soda manufacturing also you brought together a lot of different very different organizations that also in a way guarantees your financial uh, sustainability how did you find all these people how did you get together this kind of partnership there um, yeah we asked around <laughs> but uh, I. I think the, the initial idea which we work with in here is that uh, if you actually want to really make things work, you should like decentralize. Because if, if you need something to work, you can't just like do it all by yourself. It's, uh, it's better to find uh, some active group of people who can invest all they have into the project. And it is the same with the city owning the building, but they, they weren't able to manage it. It is not a fail, it's the city. They have to like take care of, of lights in the streets and waste and all this, so it's okay. So that's where we came in. We micromanage only this project. And at the same time, we knew we wanted to have like services on the perimeter, but we didn't want to man manage them because we couldn't. We have like all the other things around the buildings to work on. So we just started actively looking for those like active uh, groups and organizations and uh, we began to invite them to like do something in those spaces that we can like offer to them and uh, we've pretty much like changed all all those all those um, all the all the groups who run those spaces we pretty much changed them all because at the beginning we like make this open call and but afterwards pretty much all of those uh, things uh, turned out not to work. But as uh, the old market hall had been something that uh, was functional for some years, uh, the really good things began to come to us. So, and uh, that's what is going on right now. And I think everything is working just nicely. Thank you, Denise. I think we'll have much more time in the, the breakout rooms. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to move over to Bojena. You started already telling us uh, about the relationship with uh, Harald Binder, the owner of the, the factory, 
What other partnerships did you need in, uh, in developing the Jam Factory? For example, with the municipality, with other actors, if you can tell us a little bit about this. Right. I was I started already uh, telling about the partnership. Yes, of course, that was really crucial for them to have other partners involved in the process of uh, renovation of the jam factory. Uh, well, um, I, you ask about the municipality. So the municipality uh, played an important role, uh, but um, non-financial at all. And um, well, they consider um, jam factory as part of this neighborhood, um, which is in that post-industrial one. And um, so they switched on, on the later stage um, um, and um, uh, had uh, on our request when we faced a lot of bureaucratic um, difficulties. Uh, we had a meeting um, and uh, for that reason, a city appointed a person that was responsible for our project. Um, and um, uh, we could uh, address uh, or discuss or consult uh, while having a lot of troubles with um, procedures of uh, receiving the all kinds of permission um, uh, which were on the municipality level or later on the state level. Uh, but besides that, I believe that a very important partnership in, uh, were with um, architectural bureaus. So um, uh, at the very beginning, when we started the project, we selected our architectural bureau from Vienna. Uh, I mentioned them already. It's um, Antalya Stefan Riedler, uh, which uh, came up with, um, uh, with an idea of um, um, how and where um, have to in the, in the approach of transformation of the jam factory. But um, I believe this is quite a, a unique uh, way how we uh, came along uh, with deciding um, transformation of the building. Harald Bender himself was involved very closely in the deciding every step of the transformation of the building. We also, um, according to the law, we had to select local architectural bureau, which also played an important role of uh, coming up with certain decisions. Also a person, uh, which is uh, now the director for the construction, uh, Harald Pastor was involved um, in the different processes. When we started, when we came to the point of um, applying with the main permission for construction, we had uh, one more company that um, became partners. Um, it's also international co uh, company that um, that is now currently helping us uh, steering up the pro all the process. So it's the management of the site. It's the management of all the um, uh, do documentation applying, receiving them, uh, communication and selecting the general contractor, uh, communicating also with the city, with the state, and also um, talking to us. So um, and currently we are working if we are talking talking about the transformation pro process of the building, um, there are four major partners involved. So we, Jam Factory or Harald Binder Culture Enterprises, um, uh, the management company, it's like Delta, Archi local ar architectural bureau and uh, uh, main, contr uh, main contractor, which is uh, um, in charge of uh, building and restor restoring a cultural heritage building. So you have an international partnership and in the same time a local partnership. I have one last question about your embeddedness in the local cultural scene now, because, because you are a new cultural institution. You mentioned there was no contemporary art center uh, in Lviv, but now there is. Uh, but how can you work with other institutions that maybe have maybe less internationally connected, maybe with uh, other kinds of resources? If, do you have any kind of partnerships that you could build up with those institutions? Yeah, yes, um, uh, we have some uh, partnership. Um, I would like to stress on the, um, our vision for the Jam Factory Art Center. Actually, that was at the very beginning, uh, we were uh, trying to build an international partnership um, and um, in, 
in starting different artistic projects. Um, so, uh, for example, currently we are implementing uh, two quite big um, financed by EU projects, um, and uh, this is in collaboration with other European partners. Uh, so one is in the contemporary uh, theatrical production, and another one um, in the visual art and artistic residences. But uh, for us, also, the local scene is very important. Um, in each project, we try to involve um, Ukrainian artists um, and um, um, actors and uh, those that are active uh, in um, in the, our um, artistic or cultural scene. Um, so briefly uh, answering that question, and um, uh, I would. I would also like to stress that, yeah, we don't have a big contemporary art center. We have um, actor, like uh, we have small um, organizations that were active already for a while, uh, or some personalities that were involved in the creating of content or some performance school, which also is important. Um, we are not created from, like the, there is a context uh, that was created um, and we have a lot of things which we can work with. Thank you, Bojana. There will be more space and time to discuss this in details in the, the breakout rooms. I would like to move over to Dubrovnik with, with Petra, uh, if you're still with us. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think in my understanding, uh, the, the platform for Lazaretti, you, you built up a very specific kind of a platform where the very different organizations came together with, with the joint, uh, let's say joint objectives, joint aims. Um, can you tell us a little bit, how did you structure this? How did this come together as a platform? Well, like I've said, uh, Lazaretti were both the, at one point, the unwanted child of Dubrovnik and then very wanted child of Dubrovnik uh, as the tourism, mass, mass tourism uh, was uh, growing in the early 2000s. So uh, all of these NGOs uh, were working in Lazaretti since the 1990s, Art Workshop Lazaretti since 88, uh, Desha Dubrovnik since 96, and uh, Student Tulero at the beginning of 2000s. And uh, actually they were all uh, neighbors. And um, as I previous, previously mentioned, the Art Workshop Lazaretti was given a contract for the three buildings in the complex for 25 years in 2000. So until to 2025. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Platform for Lazaretti as um, identity of these uh, NGOs didn't come as um, in good times, but in bad times meaning that in 2012, uh, with this whole craze uh, with Lazaretti to be commodified, uh, commercialized and tur touristified, uh, meant that uh, they were in danger of um, the city of Dubrovnik uh, breaking their contract and kicking them out. So basically they joined together and uh, started from then on uh, to negotiate, advo advocate their position in Lazaretti and to work as much on establishing the social cultural center that they begin with as an idea. So um, basically there are still, uh, for the last uh, year or so, we've been working on a protocol for a platform for Lazaretti, meaning that they've uh, come together in a mutual uh, vision and mission as an unofficial, still unofficial organization, but also have uh, written down the rules of how uh, other uh, organizations or uh, citizens can um, use their spaces in Lazaretti. So basically structured um, the, the practice that was uh, already uh, there. So you have a number of organizations that are inside and you have a, a, you know, a protocol for collaboration between you and then a number of organizations that are outside, but they can use this, some of the spaces according to another connected protocol. How did you develop this? How did this, uh, because it's a very conscious process and I know in, in Croatia there's been a similar processes in different cities. How did you come together all this and design this kind of governance uh, structure? Uh, when it comes to lending out uh, spaces for other um, uh, uh, NGOs or citizens, we had in summer of 2019, we had an open call 
for uh, other organizations or citizens to apply with their activities to be held in uh, Vazarity. We help them in um, uh, writing down this, these activities, applying for uh, several funds, uh, including Ministry of Culture, City of Dubrovnik and uh, the county. Um, so uh, at the same time, we help them organizationally, but also spatially. Um, when it comes to um, uh, collaborating, uh, so these, uh, when we talk about Lazaretti as a social cultural center, you need to know that uh, this is a current um, cultural policy that is happening in uh, Croatia, where um, these social cultural centers are basically being established uh, uh, in spaces that have been for a very long time, even several decades, governed or uh, made by uh, NGOs, and uh, basically develop further on, on uh, civil public uh, partnerships. So we collaborate intensively with other, uh, for example, examples from uh, Zagreb, Split, uh, Chakovets, Halos, all of these other cities in uh, Croatia. And when it comes to um, uh, communicating and collaborating with uh, uh, other actors, uh, for example, the Heritage Dubrovnik, which is a public company which uh, has a contract uh, in the name of uh, City of or Dubrovnik to govern the whole of uh, Lazarity. Um, uh, we realized that we needed a more flexible uh, governance uh, uh, protocol and method in order to respect the autonomy of everyone involved, uh, whether it's a platform for Lazarity, uh, cultural institution uh, Linjo, or um, Heritage itself, Dubrovnik Heritage itself. So we basically established a game of position of establishing two working groups one was for technical matters and another was for program matters whether it's collaborative uh, program whether it's um, a program from other uh, users so we are taking it uh, slowly and uh, develop and basically relying on uh, some practices that uh, turned out to be good in the previous years Thanks a lot, Petra. We'll get more into this uh, in the breakout room. And I would like to move over to Nadia. As you saw, uh, we won't have a specific separated Q&A session because as always, we're running a bit late, but I'm trying to integrate here your questions. And with Nadia, I would start with a question that is uh, coming from Alice uh, about how to fund projects that are located in low density of the beaten track rural areas. And I think uh, La Fabrica is kind of a, a place like this. So Nadia, you are both from Platonic and from the Fabrica. How did you set up this uh, crowdfunding campaign? Who did you need to be on board? Who were the people that were, or organizations that were really crucial to have uh, with you in order to reach more people to fund your, your projects? Well, um, just to be clear, I'm only from Platonique, but I do know how the funding happened. So what was very, very important was that the region of Extremadura had a match funding open call using the Goteo platform. So essential to this process was that a dollar, euro for euro, the region of Extremadura was willing to match all of the public's funds. Um, they had so just to also talk about how this whole project is funded, the physical space of the, so a lot of the physical materials for to reconstruct La Fabrica de Toda la Vida is coming from the town council. And outside of these provisions, there have been basically 92 different contributors to make this project happen. Um, so over the course of time, I guess, I would say there's a unique situation where the region was willing to fund, but also looking for other small grants and funders in the area was so very you, So important. you had to build up a, a diversity of, of fundings. Did you ever think of applying for EU funding, for example? We got a question about this. If EU funding is seen as too complicated by our observatory cases. Um, well, when talking to La Fabrica, um, I'm, I don't think that so far that they have considered EU funding. A lot of the funding has been at a very national level. Um, even the Fondos de Ceder, which was a big contributor, went through the region of Extremadura to release so that, their funds. Okay, thank you. So that's a message to uh, the European Commission that maybe we need also more targeted funding for smaller initiatives on the ground that maybe find it sometimes complicated to access this kind of funding. Um, just one last question, Nadia, about uh, 
for example, you, you talk, you, you work with the region, you work with the municipality, you work, there's Goteo that is uh, coming as a, as a as support. What other very key partners do you have locally? Um, I think it's important that within, for instance, the actual platform of Goteo has several partners, both at regional and local levels. They have a history of over the past five years of working with public institutions. So there is a lot of trust. Um, and so a big part of this is also developing this framework of co-responsibility. As I mentioned in the La Fabrica case, um, what was very important for the region, for the local um, actors and activists to implement was creating a safe and secure um, space. So there's just basically with the network of um, Goteo, but also within the framework of Goteo, is the possibility to network, but also um, allocate responsibilities. I think we're very lucky that within Goteo, we do have these relationships with um, regional and um, more local actors. Thank you, Nadia. Again, we will go more in, in depth <laughs> in, the, in the breakout room, also with Olivier, who's uh, going to join us. I, we have to close this session now, but we still have some questions that came in from, from you. For example, Prospero is asking about legal issues that in the uh, Startup Regency Old Market uh, Hall you had to encounter. Legal issues, uh, I, I would interpret as uh, any kind of legal obstacles for the renovation, for the uses of the building. Uh, Denise, if you, if you have any insights on, on legal barriers that you were facing uh, with the Startup Regency. This is quite a broad question, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, there are, there are always legal issues, but I, I don't think any of them are that significant. I mean, uh, we do have to deal with uh, sound and, and the noise that we produce in the building. Like uh, originally we intended to uh, be more on the cultural side, program-wise. We had concerts and such, but uh, uh, we found out pretty soon that we can't do this because we don't meet the, like um, the noise criteria. So we had to uh, cancel those kind of noisy events. So that's one legal issue that we had to deal with. And then, I mean, there are many others, but those are like day-to-day -day basis things that you deal with like even personally in your life. So I, I can really think of anything else that I would pretty much pinpoint. I would but if, if I think about something, I can uh, reply in the chat. Please, yes. Thanks a lot, Danisa. <laughs> I also invite Tosfero to read the observatory cases that you can find on uh, openheritage.eu and they tell a lot about these issues as well. Uh, we also had a, a comment from Patrizia Di Monte who, uh, runs, co-runs uh, a sister project of ours, uh, Generative Commons. Uh, they, they deal with similar issues, so we also encourage you to visit uh, generativecommons.eu, which is the website of this project. And also we got a comment about, we, we were questions about uh, similarities or differences between the different governance models and financial models that we found between the observatory cases. Uh, we, this is something we're working on now, so there's uh, 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 different working groups are looking into uh, comparing, also extracting some models from, from the uh, observatory cases. So this is something that we will, uh, we will get back to you uh, very soon. I would like to thank you all for being with us for this uh, discussion, so we will have to close this now. I will give it back to uh, Yasmin. And we will have a little break, I think, and then we will meet all of you in the Zoom, not in the Facebook, unfortunately, for more in-depth discussions in the breakout rooms. Thank you all for your participation and thank you uh, on Facebook for following us.